Okay, well, I'll give it some thought. Well, what I'll do then, because I know I'm obfuscating a bit here as I do, I'll take you through a typical session. Mm -hmm. That's probably the best way to do it. Okay. So, yeah, you, so we'll turn up at the, the, the office and normal times we sit down, you know, exchange pleasantries. She keeps them to a minimum for me. And then um, which she'll say something like, uh, she'll probably go straight into an exercise, something like um, what in the last week, something that happened, would you do differently now as opposed to then? Mm -hmm. So I would find an, an incident of some description and then I would look at how I'd do it differently if I wouldn't do it differently. And she'd ask me, why would you keep doing it the same way? Is it a good thing or a bad thing? And then she might... Um, ask me what else I did that week, uh, anything else thinks of interest. And then she might ask me something more specific, like I mentioned last week, something about sex and intimacy. And in one case, she said, do you think all sex is, is intimacy? And I said, for me, sex never contained much intimacy. Hmm. It was just the act was pleasurable, and that's why I did it. Uh, so she would say stuff like, do you think that's intimacy in anything? So I would, from there, she would, I would move on and I'd say, well, nothing pretty much is what I would call an intimate uh, situation from what I understand other people to mean by that. So the only person I'd say I was really intimate with would be uh, my wife or members of my family on, on certain occasions. And then she might ask me, do you think that's what other people do? And I would either say yes or no, depending on what I felt at the time. Mm -hmm. So that would be the rough structure of how he does it. There would be different things. Sometimes she, she would put exercises in if I said or did something from, from previous events. She sometimes asks about like world affairs and generalities. And sometimes she'd ask about specifics. And she said that's to try and, and get different perspectives on things so that she'll get me to to open up and then she can work with whatever it is I tell her, basically. That's really interesting. I can kind of see a little bit what she's trying to do and just trying to get you to review the week and what would you do differently? Because she's not telling you to be a different person. It sounds like she really is trying to kind of get you to self-reflect a little bit more and to think what is your true preference about how the week should have gone, you know, not like let's it's, it's in the past, you know, it's over and done with, but, like what, how do you, in a way, how do you feel about it? <laughs> you know, it's yeah, like a, a really clever way to do it. And she said she had to come up with it pretty much for me. She, she does a lot of work in prisons and things like that. So she's used to dealing with, she doesn't describe me as volatile as such, but I'm, I'm difficult because I don't follow normal patterns. I'm not deliberately trying to be difficult. I just think differently. Yes. She doesn't, uh, she doesn't really see people as she doesn't see anybody's bad she thinks people are just who they are depending on the circumstances what they're like I mean she opened up to me a bit about things happening in her life and you know which is which is what I think therapists do now it used to very much be you'd lie on the couch and and they'd tell you stuff they don't have couches anymore I did ask about that so <laughs> People, people used to just fall asleep or pretend to which is why they stopped having couches yeah that's there you interesting. Go. Yeah. So yeah, so that yeah, she does. She's not critical. She's very sort of honest, and she's not wary of me as such. I think she's dealt. I think she's dealt with a lot more dangerous people than me. Yeah. And you know, certain people are really psychotic. You know, completely nuts. You know, they're not different mind types. They're just crazy. You know, that's kind yeah. of an interesting point. I wonder how much because you know that this is true. I think you probably should do know that like a lot of therapists just would not treat somebody like us just on principle or whatever. You know, they're just like, I, I wouldn't, you know, I, I'm not going to do it. And uh, some of them are like, well, I don't want you to use the therapy to just get worse, to manipulate people better. Uh, <laughs> you know, they don't trust us, you know, or whatever else. And I think a lot of it, though, is like a little bit of an insecurity. Like, I think they really do uh, kind of think like, well, maybe I couldn't handle it or maybe it would get out of control and they don't like that uh, fear. And but if she already has, you know, dealt with worse and she's held her own, yeah. then she doesn't have yeah. that same problem. Well, she said herself that, that 
well, the other thing she said was quite interesting. She says, they say like therapists don't like to label people, even though they have all these labels. What she said they meant by that was that everybody's an individual, no matter what type of person they are. So even though I would say the spectrum between people like us is a bit more narrow, right. even in our speech patterns between all of us on, on Discord, you'll see similarities between how we express ourselves. Mm -hmm. I think the broader spectrum of people that might be wider but even within that she says we are individuals so nobody's giving therapy to an psychopath they're giving therapy to a person and yeah I might raise that with her because yeah I got that impression that a lot of therapists would wouldn't deal with people like us because well she said in the past we were regarded as incurable but they used to say that about gay people didn't they yeah. you know well, I said, well, we're not, I don't particularly want to be cured. She did ask me the question, you've asked people before, if you could choose, would you not be who you are, the way you are? Would you still be a psychopath if you could choose? And I, I that, that's quite an interesting question because superficially I would just say, well, I think I wouldn't want to be any different than what I am. Mm -hmm. But the trick is, if she asked me to expand on that, because we're very good at glib answers. Right. You notice that. We're very good at saying the right small amount of thing to diffuse or deflect the situation. Yes. So you say the right answer and it shuts it down. She so goes, well, okay, that's fine. But why would you say that? Look at our people. I said, I'm glad there are empaths in the world. I don't think a world full of psychopaths would last very long because we are very much dependent on other people to build things. Like I don't, I've not known many psychopaths to be particularly creative. Uh -huh. I mean, we're inventive and ingenious in many ways, but actually creating something that's different. But then again, that that's because I'm thinking as we do in most conversations of the top end, there's probably a lot of people around about the four and five level. Yeah. We've got the balance right. Who, who may be that so overall I, I would say no because the price of it I mean I've seen people get these horrible mental illnesses they get they get depressed and you know they kill themselves and they they can't relate to people and are sad all the time and so I don't particularly want that side of it <laughs> so overall, I would say no I, I, I would say I probably get happy as I am but then as I say, I don't know any difference. So, right. Yeah. It kind of reminds me, you know, I just read a tweet because I follow a couple, I, I guess, what do we call them? Startup people uh, out of Silicon Valley on Twitter. And one of them was kind of making a joke saying, you know, like, oh, there's a person, startup founder who, you know, is getting paid by venture capital and uses, puts half of her money that she earns in Bitcoin, puts the other half in, in angel investing right that's her oh and her her company doesn't make any money you know it's not profitable and then she runs into somebody at the grocery store who's like 55 you know has a nine to five job is planning on retiring on social security <laughs> and they, they both say to themselves wow that's kind of a risky lifestyle you're leading <laughs> yeah that's kind of an analogy yeah because it, it's it's that's the thing isn't it it's what i mean i i think I think life's interesting. I mean, I'm really good at what I do, but certainly I don't hold down jobs for very long. I can. I worked in the same company for about 10 years, but that was because it could change all the time. Mm. But that's more because after about a year to two to three years, I get bored. Yeah. Fortunately, in the IT industry, that kind of turnover is actually pretty normal, mm -hmm. how most projects last. So I tend to do that, and I'm quite happy with that. I did ask her stuff about um, dealing with management-type people because I have no innate respect for people's position. Right. I just think they've got a job. And I mean, like I said, I, I got into trouble, as I said earlier, with that chap outing me because how my reaction to what the bosses were going to be mm. showed me no fear of it. I didn't care. And he thought that was extraordinary. And a lot of people say that, like, this person runs the company. So what? They run the company. It's a job, isn't it? They're not, you know, yes. they're not on my side. And that, that I find 
causes problems because they depend very much on people to be at least wary of them. Right. They've got someone like me who's already in a IT's kind of off to the side. It's very expensive, so it gets a seat in the board, but most people don't like it, which which is fair enough. I mean, it's a screwdriver to most people, isn't it? Yeah. So that, I tend to be okay there, but I do clash, and that is one of my patterns. I just, I've left jobs where the interview's always been the same. They'll say things like, thanks your service. Technically, you were brilliant, but I think our philosophies differed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah realize we had a philosophy but yes it's just stuff like that and that's very much one of my patterns I think but I don't know I don't know if that is just because you mentioned before I did relate to that the, the boredom thing mm-hmm. where we tend to get bored quickly and and uh, and even to the point of doing some fairly erratic behavior just to escape it oh absolutely I I think and Aria has said you know she probably has some of the you know, uh, typical, more of the typical behaviors, I think, you know, like a criminal record and stuff. And she basically admits, you know, almost all of those can be attributed to boredom. She was bored, you know, she couldn't, and she says she feels boredom like worse than like a sickness, you know, that it's the worst sickness, that she'd rather have the flu, you know, for weeks uh, rather than be bored for like five minutes. Uh, Yes, I, I could see that. I don't know if I get it as intense as she does. But I can certainly relate to that. It's a funny, I think board's the word we use for it, but I don't know if that's actually what it's like, what it feels like. It's more a kind of, I don't know, it is a kind of numbness, really. Yes. Where you can't find enough stimulus, so you have to go do something. And as I said, I find that to get out of that, I sometimes need quite extreme reactions. And crime, I mean, I did that when I was younger, like shoplifting. Like, I got to the point where, I once went to a jeweler and stole an expensive woman's watch and then I put it back in the same day (laughs) for a bet. And this bet was for like, I'd say like 20 quid, $40. Mm -hmm. And the watch was... If I got caught doing that, I probably would have done time. I certainly would have got a record. And I did that as a bet because somebody said, could you do this? I thought, I'll try it. (laughs) (laughs) That's a great story. It was great. I did like doing it. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, that's going to be honest. I I like doing it. It was a really thrilling thing to do. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff I had to watch out for. I mean, I've got to be honest again. The other thing she said, my therapist raised up with, haven't you been lucky sometimes as well? Yes. Because I attribute everything to my brilliance. (laughs) But in circumstances, I have to admit, fortune was on my side. You know, yeah. I've got lucky. I probably would have, I could have gotten into trouble with the laws lots of times because of behaviours, because I I just, uh, I don't know, it's not I don't have respect for the law or I don't think it doesn't apply to me. People often say that when they talk about psychopaths and I don't really agree with that. It's not so much we don't think it applies to us. It's just that at the time we can bend it or break it and it doesn't really cause a great deal of harm. And it's just something to do because, you know, I mean, I've known a lot of cops for various reasons, not military guys, and some of the worst criminals I've ever met were policemen. Yeah. And I don't think it's any particular disrespect for the law, because as you say, you know, we have a disrespect for the law of physics or kind of just like, it's not even a disrespect. It's like a disregard, you know, like we're also like you know, climbing things that we shouldn't be climbing, you know, and could fall yeah, to our death. All the time. Like scaffolding. When we were outside our school, there was some scaffolding and they said, it's dangerous, don't climb the scaffolding. So we climbed the scaffolding and got caught. And back in those days, we used to get corporal punishment mm. where they'd hit you with this big leather belt across the palm. Mm-hmm. The school was brutal. It was like Hogwarts. <laughs> so we got, we got caught for that. And and you know this guy was 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 quite nice. Oh, Body, we're gonna get hit with it, and and I thought oh, it's fair enough. And and I I was I was like talking my way out of it as I did it before. Unfortunately, the guy who who caught me knew the other bloke who'd caught us doing it the week before, hmm. and we we didn't get away with that one. Mm-hmm. But yeah, and, and I did that partially. I did it just because they told me I shouldn't, and I was like. I don't know, 11 at the time, and partially because it was an interesting thing to do. Yeah. So, and that's why I did it. It was probably really dangerous, but 
it's there's danger in this danger. I mean, there was a scaffold and it wasn't going to fall down. Right. We could have fallen off it, I suppose, but you know, I it I never really think of that at the time. Yeah. So it's interesting that you say kind of like this uh, boredom, it's almost like not a boredom. So again, you know, I was listening to that continuing legal education uh, seminar where he's talking about borderline and he kind of talks about an emptiness and it's, uh, you know, I've, yeah. I've uh, you know, written a little bit about it before. And I think in this like second book, I'm like thinking more about it. And so I'm going to run by you, uh, run a theory by you, if you don't mm -hmm. mind. So I think the Boredom, I kind of think maybe a source of it is that uh, it comes from a lack of uh, kind of regular self-expression. Like I think that people, you know, normal people, they have a sense of identity. And when they make choices, they're like, this represents me in some way. You know, like I'm going to tell the truth. I'm an honest person. Mm -hmm. So yeah. for them, a lot of these simple daily uh, choices even like buying organic, you know, I care about my health or, you know, I care about the earth or whatever else they're doing. They're reflecting their self <clears throat> and their values mm -hmm. and the, their preferences as they're making these kind of daily choices. You know, you take a, a psychopath, sociopath type person, uh, and let's say they have a weaker sense of self. They don't really have that. They're not making choices based on that type of thing. You know, it's like, uh, do you, I mean, do you eat organic food? No, well, I no, I, I well, I know lots of people that do, but yeah, they're, they're an allotment, Jen, Jen. Yeah, I'm like, who cares, kind of, you know, like even though I know there are chemicals going in my body. Yeah, I, mean, I like, always make the joke that I never touch the inorganic foods myself, but yeah, I don't, yeah, I, I don't really care about stuff like that. I think that you take sensible precautions what you but I mean, if they take away all the preservatives and all the insecticides, there won't be enough food to feed all the people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. But yeah, I agree, I agree with your theory. Yes. You, I think that they, the people, they have a kind of framework and they can hang their opinions off it and their actions off it. And that gives them something to move on to the next thing. So like you said, they become an environmentalist, for example. Yeah. They would then do environmental things, organic things. Yeah, I, I would say that's true. I don't think I think the emptiness is a good descriptor because it's like we I don't have that framework and sometimes it just I don't know why it gets keyed I don't know if it's triggered or not I, I don't know but sometimes it just happens and you just have that feeling that kind of emptiness and it's like I need to get a kickstart out of it I, I think about doing something to to shift it Yes. And, you know, I would say emptiness. Sometimes people are like, oh, emptiness, that sounds melodramatic. I think like almost a better term is just like absence, you know, and I want to say even like meaninglessness, because I think and maybe let me know if you've had this experience, too. But one thing that kind of uh, prompted me to do this perspective shift that we talked about, where you mm -hmm. kind of start to see people as being more real. Uh, you know, people just like you who have mm -hmm. inner worlds that are just as as authentic as yours. Uh, that mm -hmm. the shift was in part prompted by like the sense of like who cares if I do anything, you know? Because like so I you know kind of talk about these stages during my playground stage in my twenties, mostly early twenties. You know, it was mm -hmm. like I I didn't care. Everything was just new, and I was going from you know university to law school, and then law school to working, and you know yeah. moving different cities, and it was just all kind of exciting. And I kind of didn't care. You know, I was like having fun, mm -hmm. and then yeah. at a certain point, I I stopped kind of moving cities as much, and then I I was just stuck with being in my same profession. And I do think I was you know I I could say I was getting bored. But ultimately, I think I was feeling like there wasn't any real reason to be doing anything. Yeah, directionless. Yeah, I, I do. I did say that. Yeah, I did notice that. I would say because I've compared that with with empathic people, and they have a consistency mm -hmm. that I don't have. I do envy that. Like you said, some people are like, I believe in this. I like. I'm this type of person, and they're that type of person forever. If I say I'm this type of person, it'll probably last about a week if I yeah. really push it. And then I start doubting it. And I like the idea of the meaningless stuff because I've I've done that. I even turned to look at philosophy for a bit, which was interesting in its way. And because I thought, well, does anything actually mean anything? Right. 
I mean, the only reason, like you said, a bit different perspective, I was looking at, well, other people find meaning in things I really don't find meaning in. And I started to look at um, look at them as, yeah, I see what you mean, Pricks. I started to look at them as other than just objects, cyphers. Because somebody once said to me, um, do you objectify women? And I said, I objectify everything. That's how I tell things apart from each other. <laughs> <laughs> and it was dead and dead. I actually meant it. I labelled everything because that's how I knew X was Y. And like you said, I started to think that that is that is that really all there is to it? Is there do why do people who are empire who to me seem like these erratic dummies who who you know that smartest man in the room thing? I pretty much have that whenever I walk in a room. Mm -hmm. Partly because of my nature, but partly because I really am smart. So I started to always judge people that way. But that's a very one-dimensional way to look at the world, isn't it? Yes. Because I didn't judge who cares? people. Other, yeah, I didn't judge people by other traits. So so I thought, you know, and 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 also I looked at something, some to my therapist from really good. She said, You clever, yep. Yeah? You've said that that's your thing. Do you think other people have things that are as valuable or more valuable than being clever? To society hmm. and I thought okay well <laughs> possibly because immediately I go to me so I start looking at what I have other than that but then I, I started to think that she goes could you relate that to other people and uh, she's very good she, she said she does explain I'm using the word relate to other people as a way of communicating I don't expect you to suddenly turn into some kind of empathic individual who's going to sense everything everyone does right but she wants to look at is it possible that other people have viewpoints that have equal value to yours even if they don't come from a place you could recognize as having value hmm. and so i thought about that for a while and i thought well i suppose it's possible because there are lots of things in the world that exist that for various reasons that that i don't particular here to but I know they have value because I remember I was talking to someone online and he was one of these aggressive atheist people mm -hmm. who wanted to make everybody give up all the religions and I thought well why would you want to do that particularly I mean I, I don't care people can believe what they want I don't have any issue with that but why do you feel that you could somehow make the world better if you took that away from everybody like, again, you said about their argument having some reinforcement. So I, I like to argue against people anyway. So even though I wasn't a religious, I argued the religious case. For example, without religious organisation, we wouldn't have got out of the caves. Right. You know, we'd still be throwing spears at each other. So there is value in, the, in that particular way of looking at the world in those particular institutions. And so you can't just say they're all negative or they're all positive without some kind of support for it. And like most zealots, he got really annoyed at me and started to get irritated. And uh, so I just sort of kept pushing the point. I said, well, we can't have a single view of things, yeah. which for me was, was quite a breakthrough because I, I do have a single view of things. I mean, if I don't think something's relevant, like you said, I don't care. You know, I, I don't care. I can just pass through it all. So, so that that was where I think I've, I've shown some growth. I think that I've I've gone. I don't know. We'll go up and down the scale. I think that I've certainly gone to to more of a level eight. I don't think I was ever up near the top of it. To be honest, I was never a ten. Those guys are just scary. Mm -hmm. So I don't think I was ever there. So, but I think I was around. And I thought that's where I've got to now, where I've. And that's completely through the therapy I've had and looking at things and and opening up. And it, it all really started with when I, I thought I, I never really considered the psychopathic angle to things till I read your book. I'm almost certain my therapist had, but she didn't approach it like that, probably because of the reverse of what you said. Therapists don't trust us. Mm -hmm. But then telling someone, I think you're a psychopath, without some kind of framework could be quite, you know, dangerous. Yeah. 
particularly if the person wasn't, you know, I can imagine some person who's already having psychological issues suddenly getting told they're Hannibal Lecter. <laughs> so, you know, so that, that was good. But yeah, so I looked at that. So I think that that was, for me, one of the benefits of therapy was this shift in perspective. It's subtle, though, isn't it? You, you don't, because it, when, you, when you're articulating it, it can sometimes be overemphasized. It's not like I'm suddenly chunned into someone else or that I'm suddenly going to understand everybody else's emotional states or I'm going to start caring about stuff I didn't care about before. But it does mean I'm less dismissive of these things. I'm less dismissive of people as people. You know, they, they were always... Um, ciphers on... I mean, I suppose the way it looks at it, I suppose I regarded people as if they were significant or important to me I regarded them as characters I had to deal with in some way mm. if I didn't they were like a video game they were NPCs non-playing characters they were just there for background and extras in the movie yeah and I remember I said that to someone once I think I was drunk ages and ages ago and they just didn't have a clue what I was talking about <laughs> which I thought, I thought that was a bit odd. I thought, don't you ever feel like that? And they went, no, I don't ever feel like that. So, okay, fair enough. <laughs> so <laughs> moving swiftly on. But that, yeah. that's how I would say I used to see the world almost entirely. People were composed of people of significance at the time and everybody else was just like an extra on the film. Right. So now I've, I've got more to the point. I've seen them as people. I mean, I, I think an example of that, if you agree with this is I don't get memorial services if you have a tragic event and people are killed and injured and, and everyone's mourning and, and it's terrible then they learn the lesson and they move on but they do these things a lot don't they where they have like this is the anniversary of this great disaster like mm -hmm. 10 years ago and I think well why do you have an anniversary of something that's done now you know the people aren't any less dead Mm -hmm. So that kind of thing I don't get. I, I don't get anniversary. Like I said, my sisters and stuff, they're saying we're, we're having a, a sort of anniversary of the day that, the, the, you know, my dad died or something. What are you doing that for? You know, I don't. <laughs> that, that's exactly how I said it, which again goes, you can't say that, don't you? So I said, well, so that was fine. So, yeah, so I'm. I'm, I, I don't know, progress, I'm trying to find the right words. I'm, progress doesn't sound right. I, I'm making the shift, as you say, I'm making that perspective shift to be different. And it's interesting, like you said, it does help as well with the, the, the numbness, the emptiness we're talking about, the meaningless before. It can help with that when you get there. You can sometimes think that, well, that's fine. It's just what it is, but other people are out there so you can engage with someone else and see if that can change things. Well, see, I was going to, I was going to ask you because you were talking earlier about how you are more yourself. You act more yourself now uh, than you have before. And do you feel like yeah. that in some ways also scratches this boredom slash meaninglessness slash emptiness itch? You know, does that kind of... Do. Yes, I, I would say definitely yes. In fact, it, it's probably a way I even identified the emptiness because before I, I heard other people speak and I didn't really even have a name for it. It's just a kind of way I felt and I just or I had different names for it and then I would adjust to it and i try and do something about it. And certainly, yes, I think it definitely helps to, to build that framework that other people have. For all I know, everybody has that some to some degree. I don't know. Maybe they do, maybe they don't, but certainly for me, it, it has helped, which is why I said earlier, I think therapy is good if we can find. However, like you said, you've got to find the right therapist. Uh huh. Yes, it is true. Not all therapists yeah. are created equally. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah. yeah. It's not all of them are in God's image. Well, so, you yeah, know, I'm going to give you the flip side of this, you know, because I, I, I do think I have kind of noticed a connection. This is like my working theory that when you have like a weak sense of self, you're not really self-expressing because you don't really feel like you have any self to express, you know, like you, you're not getting these daily self-expressions and your daily choices the way that normal people are. When you start to kind of identify more with yourself 
and you are kind of as you have become more yourself, then you start having more self-expression, even in these daily choices. And that somehow kind of soothes this sense of purposelessness because you do have a purpose now and it's just to try to be you in that moment it's to be the the person you know the uh even the thing even objectifying like you know we we look at art and we think art is beautiful when it it so kind of perfectly encapsulates its purpose you know it is so perfectly the thing that it is yes yes i i would i would yes i, I would say that because i I think, yeah, because a lot of the problems I had with self-expression would be that. And it's also the reason I think I never liked to talk about myself in any detail, because the truth was I didn't really have anything to say. It would be a reflection of whatever someone was throwing at me. And I like that idea that the weak sense of self, I definitely say that was true. And yes, I'd agree that it's more of, I'm more aware of myself as an entity that differs from others as opposed to just this kind of um, reflective void. Yeah. I think it also fuels that that drive we have to dominate people. Yes. To somehow control what they do. Because if we can make them do something, it's almost like we're expressing that action. Yes. But it's through them because it's more real through someone else than it is simply coming from us. I agree. It's like dropping like a huge, you know, brick or something in the water, perfectly still water. Yeah. And you're like, I want to, I just want to see the results of myself. You know, I just want to see that I, I am a thing, you know, I am, you know, making a difference in this world and by seeing your effects or something. Yeah. And, and seeing, yes, I'd say, yeah, but you, it is like rather than just the ripples, you want to see the thing. Yes. Yeah. I definitely say that. I like, I definitely say that. I think that that is true. That's where I've got edges, but it's quite good. I actually uh, did mention in, in therapy that I'm doing this stuff, that I, I'd engaged with the group and I'd engaged with after I read your book. And I, I had sort of mentioned, I hadn't really mentioned it, but I just mentioned it relatively recently and said, that's quite a good thing. And she was asking that. I said, yeah, I said this uh, lady, and she was familiar with your book because it's not still on the bestseller list. You're doing well. Mm -hmm. So it, uh, yeah, so she she did um, think that that was quite good because a safe space, if you like, for people like us is quite hard to find. Well, see, being fair as much because of us as because of other people. Yes, and that is kind of the that that's why I kind of think okay, take for instance uh, the best thing that psychopaths can do to kind of soothe the boredom that causes them to mm. engage in this antisocial behavior is to mm. uh, be more true to themselves in more like daily smaller actions, but they're not able to be true to themselves. Uh, or risk being <laughs> outed. Yeah. Like just like your work situation, like you weren't even trying yeah. to be true to yourself, but somebody still yeah. was able to pick up on the fact that you're different yeah. and wanted to kind of persecute you about it. He did. Yeah, he, he, he did. He, he, I think he was toying with the idea of maybe using that to blame us for what had gone wrong at work. But he was too, he was, he was too scared to do that because he knew that I wouldn't react well to that. And I would be, and of course, he's painted this picture of me in his head. So, you know, he wasn't going to mess with me. But yeah, very much so. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think that, and I think that the, the emptiness is what we hide. I think that's what we don't want people to see. That's the bit we think that will identify us to them. Yeah, that's a very that interesting the, point. The, that's the bit we hide because you can tell that other people, well, I mean, I, I also had the benefit of a relationship that you do. If you can find a relationship with anyone and, and keep it going for long enough, you can learn things from it. But you have to be able to to do it. And like I said, I've, I've kept my relationship going because of the effort of doing it. And that ha has been of value to me in, in dealing with other relationships. Yeah. Because I didn't, I didn't really have any. I mean, I didn't, I didn't, being fair, I didn't want any. It's not like, again, I'm trying to get the right wording right to describe it because you tend to slip into familiar language you've learned. We live in an empathic world. Mm -hmm. So the language we use has empathic overtones. Right. That's the kind of way you express, whereas I'm trying to avoid doing that because it doesn't really reflect me as I now, you know, 
I've come to see myself. But it is interesting. I mean, he also, also says it's probably why we don't tend to deal much in introspection as a rule, because there's not much to introspect. People yeah. would say, what was your motivation for doing that? And I was comfortable in, in, in structured environments where I'd have a, a reasonable explanation for doing it. But if they wanted a pure emotional reason why I did something, I simply didn't have one. Right. And I didn't want to admit that to people, that I really didn't have one. I don't do anything instinctively. Yes. And Everything I, I do is conscious. I think <laughs> that is probably like a good little microcosm example of what I'm talking about for normal people to understand about meaninglessness. Like there really mm. isn't a reason, you know, apart from just like, you know, well, you know, it's better to have money than not have money, you know, there, but there is, it's not deeper than that. <laughs> There's never a deeper reason oh, for our yeah. choices. Yes, that's exactly it. If, like, I like to have more money than less because it's comfortable to give it. I don't have any great symbolism. Why is like people say I use money as a as an, a symbol or as an expression of this desire or that desire or this thing or that thing? And yeah, I just need money because if you don't have any, you don't have any food and you end up dead. So, exactly. Yeah, it's not even like I want to be a rich person or something. It's not even like that. I don't care. No, I don't particularly care. I mean, I've done jobs where I mean, I've made loads of money. and I've just, I'm not good with money. I don't really care about it. Yeah. You know, if I've got to spend it and stuff, if I don't, then I don't. But it doesn't, I don't really care about it to the point where my partner, she tends to you know, look after all the money mm. uh, because, um she cares about her stuff and she likes budgets and she does all that stuff and it's part of her job and, and all of that. But I don't really care. I mean, I've had lots and had less. I mean, it's always better to have more than less for physical reasons, but that's it to me. People say, if you won a lot of money, what would you do? And I thought, well, not a lot different, to be honest. I mean, I've been to places like I used to do, like I travel for work. They always put you up in five-star hotels when you travel for work. Mm -hmm. And I travel to other countries. I've been all over the world doing my job and I like going to hotels and do stuff like that but it's just an experience it was well, another thing I'm not good at is status symbols mm. I don't care about those at all I couldn't care less if I walk into a, a five-star restaurant whether somebody thinks I'm a millionaire or the guy who's there to fix the plumbing I don't care really couldn't care less uh, people buy fancy cars and things for status symbols. I've never really done any of that. I don't, I suppose it's like you said, don't not really care in what other people think of you. Yeah. So what is the point of a status symbol if you don't care about status? But honestly, yeah. And going just like one step deeper again, why don't we care what other people think about you? Again, my theory is because we don't really strongly uh, bond, let's say, with like our yeah. identity. We don't have a strong sense of identity. We don't have, you know, it'd be like somebody whose dad dies, yeah. but well, I never knew my dad, you know? Yeah, he's still my dad or something, but I don't I don't have a relationship with him. I feel like we have that same thing with our identity where it's like, yeah, that yeah. is our identity, but we just have like a very, you know, bi coastal relationship. Yeah. yeah, I do. Everything's destined to detach. Yeah, you're right. I think that makes sense. Yeah, there's nothing for them to... There's nothing to throw the status against because we'd never compare ourselves with others. And a good example, almost like, awesome. yeah, a counter example. Have you ever heard the term butt hurt? Yes. Yeah, butt hurt. Yeah. We, we never get butt hurt because you're only butt hurt when you, your <laughs> ego hurt. And we That's don't get. Right. Yes. No, I never get that. Yeah, I, I, I know what you mean by that. Yeah, that term of people get, I'm offended by this. And you say, well, that got nothing to do with you. Why are you offended by it? Yes. Well, it means that these, this group of people, well, I mean, you're not that particular group of person. No, so why do you care? That you know, is, what is it? Yeah. yeah, that is the flip side to my theory. And I kind of hope that normal people can kind of like learn something from seeing us one end of the extreme to realizing there's another end of the extreme where people <laughs> identify too broadly and too strongly. Yeah. Like you said about the, 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 
the cancel culture. Yes. Where you've got people cancelling. And that other thing, I, did, I had a, a debate with someone once. Was, you know these, Cameron, so these, the Chinese dresses, the typical Chinese dress, the sort of satin oh, one. Oh, yes. Yeah? Yes. Well, there was a girl and she wore it to a party we were at. And someone said, that's cultural appropriation. And I said, that style of dress is actually Cantonese and it was designed for the hookers. So the actual culture of that is not Chinese, it's Cantonese, and it's for people who used to be hookers. So I'm quite sure this girl isn't stealing the culture of a hooker to impress people at her party. Yeah. But this person was so incensed about this that she said, well, I can never speak to her again. She's she's stealing people's culture. Dang it. I said, but all cultures are made from other cultures. That's how it works. You know, otherwise everybody would still be worshiping the sun or whatever. But, you know, and, and that that kind of thing, I I just don't understand. And I I have said that. I said I don't understand how that the cultural appropriation at all. Yeah. Well, it, and that thing where you had the Native American Indians had this um, it's a pipeline going through their their uh, through their land through this sacred mountain. Right. I said, well, if it was me. I would just get the pipeline company to train your people who are looking for education and funding to work on the pipeline so they could then work on the pipeline on your your sacred mountain. Because what's the point of having a mountain? It's a mountain. <laughs> and yet you have people suffering because somebody wants to build something on a mountain. Yeah, but it, you don't understand. You don't understand sacred. Goes, well, that's true, but it's still <laughs> making the point that you know you're not you're protecting some strange belief over people who are alive now. I thought that doesn't sound very empathic to me. And they say, well, no, you don't understand deep culture or something. Yeah, deep culture, mm. but it is kind of an interesting point that you're making of mm. like, why would you be identifying with this particular thing? Like why, why, yeah. what, why? It's an external thing. It's not even you. <laughs> it's a big rock. I don't, I don't, no, no. And then they say something like this, this, this is important. And then other thing coming from Scotland is this, people going about battles that happened like 300 years ago. Mm. And it's just like, oh yeah, these people were terrible. They came in and killed all our people. I said, no, they didn't. Nobody who was alive then is alive now. This is nothing to do with you. It's like, I can see when they're trying to make, say, for example, Black Lives Matters people, they're trying to find reparations for things that were done to people which were unacceptable. And that's good. You should put the statues in museums. But I don't believe you should give people money because because none of the people were alive then. Mm -hmm. I've seen someone who is Irish. Now, there's a lot of trouble between Ireland and, and Britain historically. I don't know if you know the history, but Ireland's basically split into two bits. Right. And this was because of a revolution they had. And they once said, he goes, well, why don't all these people in Britain give us money for the struggles in Ireland? I said, well, are you going to give money to the Cornish for when the Irish invaded and stole their tin? Oh, yeah. And they said, no. <laughs> so, and I honestly don't see the difference. I can't understand why people would hang on to one thing and not the other. And my wife has, has exasperated herself on numerous occasions trying to explain this to me. But I just don't get it. I don't see what it is people are trying to achieve. But everybody involved in these things is now dead. Why don't we move on and, and do something different? Well, I think it's a really good... Uh, I'm really glad that they call it identity politics because I think it <laughs> it is 100% accurate what they describe is that somehow your identity has made it into the political sphere and like yeah. why because it's such a vulnerable position too it's essentially like you have all these like soldiers that aren't in your own country but are in another country that somebody else controls and can do whatever they want with yeah that's true i mean i've done things like an example that is i was online and i like i like harry potter and someone attacked emma watson and i decided i'd defend emma watson because, you know, maybe she'd find out and sleep with me. So <laughs> I, I did, at one point I had these I had these arguments. There was 53 different sessions going on Twitter. Now I'm arguing these cases. And at the same time, these the TERFs, the people who don't like transsexuals, they joined in as well for whatever reason. 
And I was arguing, and I got, I put the argument I was making in the wrong place. I sent it to the men's rights matters guy instead of the turf woman. Mm. And I realized I'd answered the questions. And these two extreme groups actually had a lot more in common with each other than they did with anybody else because their views had gone so extreme, they'd come full circle. Mm. And so I, I was saying to them, well, why are you attacking people for being this? Why are you attacking someone, say, for being trans? And they're saying, well, these people, don't you care about trans? I said, well, I'm probably the perfect person because I don't care. <laughs> it doesn't, I don't really care what anybody, anybody can be in like, doesn't make any difference to me. I mean, I don't, I really don't care. Somebody wants to be, uh, change their gender, which is a good identity thing. That'd be an interesting thing. People yes. who have trying, I'd, I'd like, I know one person who's like that. I might ask her about that because that's a good identity thing because they identify as, as something completely opposite. You'd need a really strong sense of self, I think, yes. to be able to do that. You know, to, to care enough about one social role and one social group to transform yourself to be that. I, that that must take a tremendous sense of, of self. Yes, and bravery, I think, you know, and I think, I think that is the odd thing about cancel culture is are they actually enabling people to live to be, you know, as true to themselves as possible? Or are they making it more of a dangerous place for people to be as true to themselves as possible? Yeah. Because if also, if you, I also think that if you're not that particular group, you should help from the back. Like, if you're not a trans person, don't fight a trans person's war. You know, I mean, yeah. okay, I could, you know, they said, like, well, you're not Emma Watson. I said, no, I'm someone who would like to sleep with Emma Watson. I've still <laughs> got a vested interest. You seem to be trying to save the whole of the trans community. For some reason that I don't understand. So, yes, yeah, so that, and I think then it's it is, and also of course, when these people cancel people, they make an enemy of that person. Yes, and that person is going to attack trans people because they're going to assume the attack came from trans people. Mm. Now that clarity of thought is something we are quite good at because we don't have the vested interest in it because we don't see the emotional content on either side. So we can see the clear, the clear problem there. Yeah. But trying to explain that to people can be very difficult. They don't want to hear it because in their minds, I think they're the hero of the story. Right. And they're, they're, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm guessing here, but they're, they're the hero and they want to be the one who's champion. They want to be on the side of right as opposed to wrong, the hero and not the villain. Well, honestly, Honestly, RT, I actually think, uh, and I have a nonprofit that is even called this, this, that everybody needs to be empowered because why is it that they feel like they have to fight these online battles for tra the transgender community, you know, and that makes them feel like the hero. I think it's because they too do not have enough self-expression in their life. They do not have enough vehicles uh, for self-expression, yeah. meaningful self-expression. Yes, maybe, maybe they should go to therapy. Maybe they're deflecting. They're, they're actually defending something else. Because the other thing is there's always a flip side, isn't there? Like some people in the TERF community have made valid points that women have been oppressed for forever. So they have had to cling on, as you know, being a woman to, to what they have. And now you've got this ultimate expression, which is men who have everything are now deciding to turn into women as well. Mm. So they want that side of life. Now I can sort of see where that's coming from, why, why people might think that, even though the individual's probably not doing it. Right. But yeah, you, the thing is, there are no heroes and villains, are there? I've always thought that. I don't know if that's just the way we think, but I don't think there are any heroes or villains. They're just people doing things at the time they do them. I mean, that I don't think, for one thing, I don't think anybody sees themselves as Voldemort. Nobody's the emperor. <laughs> nobody's nobody's Sauron. Everybody sees themselves as the hero. Well, it's like what you and said that, about the espionage communities, yeah. you know, and yeah. that, like, why is it when the UK does it, it's okay, yeah. and when somebody else does it, they're terrorists? Exactly. And and even they even have, like, the bit, did you have know that recent bit where Edward Snowden came up with this bit where... In the US and in the UK, it's not legal for their intelligence services to spy on each other. 
So what they were doing was they were getting spies from the UK to go to the US and they were getting spies from the US to come to the UK so they could spy for each other. Then they were allowed to have that information and give it to their respective governments. Mm. And I thought, well, there's no difference. They're all basically the same. And that's another thing I don't really get. I don't get tribalism very well. Right. I'm not a great joiner. I don't I don't get things like I suppose I see everything as a kind of abstract. I don't get patriotism either. I can see why people would defend what they have as a practical thing of defending it. But I don't get that leap of logic that says I'm automatically better than other people. I mean, obviously, rationally, there are some economies and some countries' configurations that are better than other ones. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, I certainly wouldn't like to any part. I've been to Dubai, for example, and you certainly wouldn't want to be a woman in Dubai. Right. Because they literally are treated as second-class citizens. Their own women particularly are very, very controlled. You know, they're not allowed to drive cars. They're not allowed to talk to men unless there's another man present. And in business, it can be a real problem because often you find that you get a unique person and you find the woman happens to the person who's got the skills you need to relate to. Mm. And so she's the technician, but she's got to bring some guy along who's just like this. He's got to be there to be the mouthpiece. And of course, me being me, I used to speak to her directly. Uh -huh. And then I get, I get calls from the boss saying, someone reported you that you, you broke this rule or other because you were speaking directly to the lady instead of to this guy. He goes, well, the guy was an idiot. And we didn't have time to deal with it. Yeah. I said, did you call him an idiot? No, I think I just said fuck off or something. <laughs> it was the fuzzy for fuck off. And so, but that, that got it done, but that kind of thing. So, but objectively in the big morass of things, I can't really tell much difference between one thing and the other. I think, I think it stems from the fact that we originated, we'd have like tribes of 120 people. Mm -hmm. So most people were designed to relate to 120 people, which mm -hmm. according to anthropologists, I'm probably designed to relate to like two people at a time, but others, that's the kind of tribal structure we have. Because it explains things like sport and stuff like that. People go crazy for sports, don't they? They get really serious about it. I actually think football hooliganism is like one of the best examples of this, where they just, their identity is too broad. And in fact, there's, a, you may want to read this. Paul Graham has an essay, mm -hmm. Keep Your Identity Small where he's essentially making oh, this argument. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, because, I mean, you get things like in Britain, for example, you've got the Premier League for football and you'll have a, a team, say, based in, say, Liverpool or Glasgow or London, one of the London teams. That team will be composed of players who come from other countries. Right. And the manager might come from another country. But those people still think it represents them and they'll defend it fiercely. And they'll that, kill that, people. Oh, well, literally. Oh, yeah, the violence. In I mean, in the UK for, for a while, we had tremendous problem with football violence. It was unbelievable. I mean, I went to, to a football match. Like, I was brought up in Glasgow and the primary teams there were Celtic and Rangers. There was also a religious divide between Catholic and Protestant. But I used to live in an area that was mostly Catholic. So I just used to go to the Celtic end of stuff and just go to the football matches there. And I never thought anything of it. And people said, well, you know, you're betraying this group of people, that group of people. <laughs> I'm not betraying anybody. I'm just going with my mates to football. I don't uh -huh. really care. And you've got to be careful, though, because people do take it really seriously. I mean, I mean, I actually meant it. I wasn't being facetious. When I say I don't care, as you know, I literally mean, I don't care. So, you know, as yeah. you're saying this, I have like another uh, thought that just came to me. Uh, like growing up, my dad is a hoarder. Do you know what a hoarder is? Yeah, very much. Yeah. yeah. So he's a hoarder, but it was really interesting to kind of see the irrationality of it because he would uh, like stuff that he thought was his, you know, that he kind of identified with, he would not throw away, you know, it was very an, an emotional, you know, upheaval to throw it away. But one time I stored a drum set in one of his mm -hmm. uh, like storage containers, little sheds or something, yeah. and he gave it away, you know, like the very next day. 
because he had no. Yeah, he didn't identify with it. He was like, this is not me. And so it wasn't just hoarding for the sake of hoarding. It's not just like, you know, I'm just not going to never give anything away. It's that they have, you know, their identity has stretched to include these items. That's true, because that would explain, because that is a thing that some people can become really clinical and end up with every newspaper they've ever bought and all that sort of thing. Right. That's interesting, yeah. And also that the other thing that he was holding only his stuff. So it wasn't just about physically retaining things. No. If it didn't have a value to him. In fact, the opposite. He seemed quite offended that you'd used his space. Yes. And (laughs) the drum set had more value than any of the other stuff in that shed. (laughs) So it's not about a value. No, that's true. That's interesting. Yeah, that is is curious. So it does seem to be that almost all human relationships and interactions come down to identity, either how other people see it or how you see it yourself. I at least think it's a very interesting lens to see things through. Yes, and it is, I suppose, in a, I mean, in a way, despite, no matter how empathic or sensitive someone is, we're all in our own head, aren't we? We can't read minds. I mean, that does bring nothing. I always fascinated by that. Empathic people who think they can read people's minds or they, they act like they know what someone else is thinking. Yeah. So I knew I knew they were thinking that. So how did you know they were thinking that? I could just tell. They were, I said, well, how? How did you? It's just a gift. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> Bet your life, would not it? <laughs> this is an interesting thing. I, I'll just share it like briefly because I'd never like to interfere too much with people's identity development. And it sounds like you are going through not identity development so much as, um, I guess, strengthening. Uh, but this type of thing, yes. I never like to mess with. And I think good therapists never try to mess either. But I think mm. one thing that's been interesting to me as I have strengthened my own sense of identity is that I have I have gotten a sense of intuition, which I never had before. Mm. But, yeah, yes. okay. So, yeah, I, I, I suppose if you think, think and start to pay more attention to people, that you will eventually develop a kind of, awareness you were saying earlier about how you'd be able to compare your experiences with theirs and it would be it's interesting the, the, the origin of intuition yeah because it is it, yeah that's interesting is it a learned trait or is it i assumed it was innate because i didn't have it but i suppose again it comes down to what makes a psychopath psychopath it's probably a combination of a genetic tendency and whatever happens in our backgrounds right you know, are we born or are we made? It's a bit like, I, th- I think it's a bit like being gay. Yes. I think you are that way, but whether you whether it's strengthened enough to become your predominant trait or not depends on your upbringing and your experiences. Yes. So that's interesting, yeah, because I, 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 I'm fascinated by it because I don't have it. But I do know it's real. I do know intuition is real. I mean, I can't explain it. And I certainly wouldn't like to, to risk it, but I've seen people do it. I've seen people do it. I remember I was in Vegas and this old lady used to, it was probably something to do with, no, like, you know, people said that she maybe subconsciously seen the tumblers turn, but knowing how these machines work, they build them specifically so people can't do that. And yet she could tell, they roughly paid out every 15 to 20 major spins. And she would, I watched her, she could, she could tell which, machine w- was going to roughly pay out within a few coin stuff. Now, she'd be doing that for a long time, mm-hmm. but I watched her carefully, and it was it was amazing to watch because she displayed other things as well, like she she phoned a friend who was in the room because she said she was upset. Oh. And that this was like magic to me. I said, what you, how do you do that? And she was, and because you get to have a feeling for other people, how they act, and and how they answer, but she's in another room. So I do know it exists. I can't explain it, uh, and I don't haven't felt it, but I do know it exists, that people can develop um, intuitive senses for things. It's fascinating that you developed it. That's really interesting. Yes, and in my own experience, I, I would say that it was a little bit like how I used to not be in touch with my body even, you know, so where I was like sick with appendicitis, but was just still kind of moving along, not going to the doctor. 
And similarly, I think that I always did have some intuition. Maybe it's a higher level or lower level than other people. I don't know. But then I just started to learn to identify with it. So you I think it was there all along. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they always have that thing, don't they? That urban, they, they talk about feminine intuition, don't they? They talk about that a lot. Yeah. And obviously, but there's always a germ of truth in these urban legend, these things. They generally have some germ of truth. And that, yeah, so that, that's possible. Yeah. I, I do know it definitely exists. I've seen it, but I, I, and another thing about being like we are, I think there's an advantage is I don't dismiss things instantly if yes. they don't feel what I've seen before. I'm open in that way to new information. I don't suffer a lot of prejudices because it's, it's, I don't have that emotional investment in it. So yes. I can see other things. And it's nice to be able to tell that because I don't often have the opportunity if at all to express that. I can see other things that I can't personally experience. Like I said before about how I don't experience complex emotions mm -hmm. and I thought they weren't any until somebody explained to me, no, people genuinely do have these, these feelings. <laughs> I love that story. <laughs> I thought I was being so brilliant. I thought I was going to get an A+. I was crushed. 